All right, well, if you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. We're just going to jump right into the, the heart of the gospel in the Old Testament. When I was in Bible college, uh, 1998 and 99, Paul Lang um, oversaw our Isaiah class, and he said, here's your final. Write a paper on Jesus in the book of Isaiah. And I had so much fun finding Jesus in Isaiah with all the cross-references to the New Testament. I was writing it out. It was like 12 pages long. And it was back in the day before autosave, and something happened, and I lost it. And I was like, oh, no, I guess i got to start over. So I did it again, Jesus in Isaiah, and I wrote. And, and going through that repetitively helped me to just get it into my heart. And uh, the Lord was in, in that. I thank God for autosave today, but uh, Isaiah is the first place I want to go today. So Isaiah 53. Actually, it's, it starts in chapter 52, in verse 13, and then we'll read through. So Isaiah 52, verse 13 and following. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. So we're introduced to this person, the servant. He shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted. So an exalted servant. Verse 14. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond the children of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has been told of them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what, the, what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him, and no halo that we would recognize him. No, that's not in there. Um, verse 2, verse 3 of chapter 53. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that, was, that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, and he shall prolong his days. And the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Now some questions. 
When was this written? It's written by Isaiah, who lived approximately 700 B.C. to 600 B.C. Okay. The Bible is divided into two major categories. Is this Old Testament or New Testament? Old Testament. Okay. When was Jesus born? Approximately? Zero or one or some say four up to six B.C. Okay, so this was written before Jesus was born. Who is this speaking of, though? Jesus. Okay, how do we know that? Okay, you can look at the, the life of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels, as recorded in the New Testament, and see uh, there's a number of prophecies in here that we could actually go through. But your first reaction is, it's, this is about Jesus. I didn't tell you that. Uh, maybe because you're Bible college students, you're educated and you know this thing, these things. But uh, uh, you could read this to a non-believer and not tell them it's in the Old Testament and then ask them, who is this about? Start with just reading the text. Say, tell me, who is this about? Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Um, he was wounded for our transgressions. Basically, who is it that died for our sins? And they say, oh, Jesus. If, if they live in the West, they probably have heard that Jesus died for their sins. Um, I've ran into people that haven't heard that, so there's going to be people that don't know this is Jesus. But of those people who are somewhat familiar with Christianity and Judaism, they're going to go to Jesus. Well, I, well, the problem with that is that they have to admit that this was written before Jesus was born. So, what I'm going to get at today, what I'm going to give you today, is the evidence for the gospel in the Old Testament. You could title it different ways, the gospel in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, th these are manuscripts that were found between 1947 and 1958 in the Qumran area near the Dead Sea, which is why they're called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And... Uh, Rather than just me talk about it, um, I do have a presentation here to show you a few slides. Um, but all of this information you can find on the internet. And you know the skeptic today, uh, even Christians, even Muslims, even um, Jews, most of the world today is online and they're looking to the internet for answers. And so if you can have an internet connection, you could walk people through the evidence for Christianity. Um, you don't have to take someone to Israel to the Shrine of the Book Museum where they have the great Isaiah scroll there in front of you and have a Hebrew scholar right next to you explaining to them that this, you know, this manuscript, it does in fact say what our Bibles say. You can now go to Google and I'll show you what you'll find. Okay, where did my thing go? Oh, you see a screensaver there. Did I close something? Yeah, I guess I closed something. Just a minute. This was what I feared would happen. Start presentation. Let's try it again. Oh, no. Proxy servers refusing connections. Okay, Jared. <laughs> All right. Well, here's what I would do. If you have, if you have, uh, okay, I have my own presentation on my screen. I just can't show it to you. So, until Jared gets here, here's what I'll give to you. Okay. Let me just, while we're waiting, I'll share a little bit of my testimony, my background, because I think it's relevant. I'm from California. Uh, my family is kind of a mixed family. My mom remarried when I was four to an agnostic. My mom grew up in a Christian home, and she heard the Bible. She knew the Bible, so she didn't really take me and my sister to church, except for when we went to visit my grandparents. Now, um, I heard the gospel when I was seven years old, 
And I believed in it intellectually, and I prayed and asked Jesus into my heart. But growing up, not going to church, not reading my Bible, I was very shallow in my faith. And I began to wonder in my teens, is there really a God? Is Christianity really true? And when I was 15, 16, 17 years old, I was thinking, uh, well, maybe there's aliens. Maybe we're here just as some sort of experiment. If there is a God, why did he put us here to suffer? And I had all of these questions and no biblical answers because I wasn't reading the Bible. Somehow I closed my presentation and there's no internet access in here. It's still there. It is? Oh, thank you. Uh, it broke. Well, I tried to open it again and that's what happened. So I was, I was lost. I was 15, 16 years old, and I was still calling myself a Christian because I said the prayer one time, actually twice when I was a little boy. Uh, but I was living like the world, and I didn't have a strong faith. And so um, what won me over was there were, there were two girls in my high school who loved Jesus. I mean, they just glowed when they talked about him. And, and they tried to tell me about him, and I was like, well, I'm, I already know that. You know, I have memorized John 3.16. I believe, therefore, I will not perish, and got my fire insurance, my ticket to heaven. That's the way I looked at it, very shallowly. And there, I heard them sharing the gospel in art class. Everyone was drawing, and I was uh, drawing, and one girl, Joy, was sharing with the girl next to her, and the whole class could hear this, saying Jesus is the whole reason why we exist, that we're not here for ourselves. We're here uh, for God. God put us here, so we should live for God. Thank you, sir. Okay. You're connected to the wireless downstairs, so it's awesome. Your work, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Jared. So I, I thought at first, well, I'm not that radical. You know, I'll believe in Jesus, but, you know, evolution, you know, abortion could be okay. Uh, I was very liberal and very, you know, not, I don't think I was really even a Christian. Um, the things I was doing on the weekends and, um, you know, I'm ashamed to say. So I had just bad fruit in my life. Uh, but these girls, they kept praying for me. You know, they're like, how can we pray for you? I'm like, well, you don't need to pray for me. We're not at church. <laughs> and, uh, and eventually they said, well, why don't you come check out our church? And uh, I was like, okay, not against it. And I went, and it was a little bit strange. It's Assemblies of God, and the girl was, fell down right next to me and was, like, weeping uncontrollably, and everyone rushed around her and was praying for her. And I was like, what is this that's going on? My grandparents were Mennonites. And... Uh, so it was, it was weird, but you know, the Lord was drawing me. And so I started going to Young Life, and then I started going to a Baptist church, and then I, I got more plugged in at, the, at church, and, and I was hearing things like for the first time from the Bible. I was not familiar with the Bible at all. And so I went to a, uh, a youth event, and there I heard the gospel again. And I was like, okay, this is what I've heard before. And you know, they led people in the prayer at the end, and I was like, okay, I prayed that prayer. What is missing? Something's missing. The next day, they shared about media and music and how that influences you, and, and the secular music that I had been listening to, like Metallica and satanic music like that, was uh, really just leading me on a course uh, into hatred, and, and just, it, I noticed it was influencing me. And... Uh, they said, you were created for God's glory. And as long as you're living for your own glory, which I was, then you're going to be frustrated, you're going to be empty, and you're not fulfilling God's will for your life. And um, I was so convicted. And so I, I just confessed that, to the Lord that, you know, I believe that. You know, not just the gospel, the facts of the gospel, but that Jesus came and died to save me. He laid down his life to redeem me so that I would be his, that my life would belong to him. And um, he spoke to me audibly that night that, you know, I've created you for my glory, and I want you, instead of making music for yourself, to make music for my glory. I was a drummer in some rock bands, and uh, yeah, you wouldn't think it, in a <laughs> punk rock band. Um, but, uh, yeah, the Lord said, I want you to glorify me with the rest of your life. And I was like that girl weeping, <laughs> and it was just real to me. I experienced God. It wasn't just in my head. It was in my heart, and 
it, it's, it changed my life forever. So I was about 17 years old. That year I got baptized and uh, started going through discipleship classes and, you know, my life has never been the same since. But you can imagine growing up in an agnostic home, what that was like for me. My, instantly, my stepdad, who's an agnostic, fired away all the questions. Well, how do you know the Bible is true? Why don't you believe in evolution? Everybody knows. All the scientists say. And I was just like this brand new Christian. Um, I don't know. <laughs> and so it sent me on this search. Well, I need to have answers for these things. And my sister as well, she's like, what are you going to do? Go live in a monastery and try to not sin ever again? It's, it's just not practical. And, you know, because I wanted to follow Jesus. And, and so I was persecuted at home by my stepdad and by my sister. Um, who are, My sister is an agnostic. And still to this day, she's an agnostic. I'm 34 years old. So, actually 35 now. So the second half of my life, I've been living for Jesus. And the first half... Uh, I was not. And so it's, it's a little bit sad for my, my family, for my sister. She says she lost her brother, but really we know that she's the one that's lost. My stepdad is the one that's lost. And, and uh, I've, done, I've made all the mistakes that I shouldn't have made in trying to share the gospel with my family. I'll, I'll share one just because it's an interesting kind of, I look back and laugh at myself. So my sister was telling me about her life, and I was listening, and then it came time for me to share, and I said, okay, well, I listen to you, will you listen to this? I start talking about the Bible, and she shuts me down right away. And so then it's time for dinner. My mom says, come. This is when you know, I'm about 25 years old. And uh, my mom says, would you, would you pray for the dinner? And, you know, my stepdad and sister respectfully you know, let us do that. And the only thing I wanted to pray, I was so upset my sister shut me down like that. I didn't want to pray, God, please bless the food and help us have a good time. It was like, the only thing that mattered to me was um, my, my unsaved relatives. And so I bowed my head and I prayed, Jesus, I pray that you would save Tally and Scott. Amen. And I, my, my stepdad's name is Scott. And I looked up and everyone's jaw was on the table. <laughs> And my mom said, well, I was hoping for something nicer than that. Uh, but anyway, that's my heart, and it hasn't changed. I still just want them to be saved. Although there are, there's, um, they're looking for evidence. Um, and yet, when you give people the evidence, there still will be maybe some resistance. It's not always problems in their minds. It's not always the intellectual arguments. We think that if we give them the intellectual arguments, they'll get saved. But the problem, that may be the, the tip of the iceberg, but the problem, like, like um, Kevin said, the root of the problem is in the heart. So coming from that background, it's really important to me to give reasons for my faith. And not just in my family, but I've been in Ukraine, a former Soviet Republic, for three years I was there. And most of the people will say they're Orthodox, but are practically speaking atheists. Now I live in Latvia, where most of the Latvians would say I'm Lutheran or Catholic or Orthodox, but practically speaking, they're atheists. Um, and there's 40% atheists there, unbelievers. And so we're going to be living, the reason why this is important for us is because we're going to be living, and we're living in times that are more and more secular, more and more, um, you know, unbelief, skepticism, uh, persecution. Just know that it's coming. But there are some who are just being fed this lie that are honestly looking for the evidence. And when people ask you, it's good to have a reason why. It's not just good. We're commanded, and as Peter said, we've looked at this before, but I just want to share my heart. We're actually commanded uh, to be ready to give a reason for the hope that's within us to anyone who asks. That's not a suggestion. It's a command. So apologetics is important for those reasons. Okay, let's go on with the presentation now. We have one hour left, so that's perfect.
and I'll have some time in the end for questions. I'll leave 10 minutes for questions, Lord willing. Oh, I just closed your presentation again. No, is it there? Okay, praise the Lord. All right. Next. So there's my family, wife and three kids. The three kids were born in three different countries, America, Ukraine, and, and Latvia. I already went through some of my background. So married in 2000, started teaching in 2001 in my home church in California, and then went on the mission field in Ukraine where my son was born, came back to California where my daughter was born, and serving in Latvia where my son was born on my birthday, the best birthday gift. By the way, my family's watching. Hi, I miss you. <laughs> so this is a picture of my sister who I told you about. She's. Uh, diehard atheist, singing in her atheist rock band. We were actually in a band together when I was 16. Um, so it's important that we are ready to answer society when they scream at us their arguments that the Bible can't be trusted, the Bible has been changed, it was doctored by the church to fit these dogmas. But they're going to ask some valid questions. They'll ask some off-the-wall questions, but here's three valid questions that they can ask us and we should have answers to. And these are the same questions that we can ask them in response. How do you know that, or whatever they're claiming, if someone makes a claim or a declaration, for example, we claim there is a God. They can ask, how do you know that? By the way, Apologetics is mostly about declaring the gospel, but it's not only about declaring. It is about defending. If we only declare, we say, there is a God, and then they ask, how do you know that? We'll say, because there is. <laughs> uh, we need to give reasons. They can also ask, why should I believe that? So it's, and we could ask them, why should I believe what you're trying to sell to me? Third question they can ask and we can ask, do you have any evidence? And our evidence is useful because it, it verifies the declaration. It verifies the claim. In other words, you, you can believe without any evidence in the gospel and be saved, but how can you prove to someone else that it's actually true? You can have the experience yourself of the Holy Spirit coming in and dwelling in your heart and changing your life. But what evidence can you give to someone else to help them to be convinced of that? So those are three valid questions that I think the Dead Sea Scrolls give us the answer to. How do you know that the Bible hasn't been changed? The Dead Sea Scrolls. Why should I believe that? Look into the Dead Sea Scrolls. Do you have any evidence? The evidence is the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, there's a lot of other kinds of evidence. But the manuscript evidence that we have for the reliability of the Bible, I'd say is the strongest evidence we have, maybe besides the empty tomb. I think the empty tomb is probably first. Second would be the manuscript evidence that the Bible hasn't been changed. And I'll go through and show you why that is. And so we need to be prepared, not just to quote the Bible or make declarations, but also to give evidence for its veracity. Veracity just means its truthfulness, authenticity. So apologetics is defending the faith as well. So here's an example of why it's important to give this defense. There's this dialogue. Christian says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Skeptic, good for you. I don't believe in that. Christian says, well, Jesus said, appealing to the authority of Jesus, uh, believe the gospel and all who believe will be saved. And here's some Bible verses to prove it. But the skeptic says, well, why should I believe that? Why should I believe that Jesus said that? And we say, well, because the Bible says so. Skeptic says, how do you know that to be true? Christian says, it's God's word. God cannot lie, Hebrews uh, 6.18. Skeptic, how do you know that it's God's word? Christian, 
Well, the Bible says all scripture is inspired, God breathed, and we go, you know, start quoting scripture and declaring the, the truth. These are truths, but you see this, what the skeptic is presenting, some valid questions that declaration is not answering. Uh, skeptic, do you have any evidence that what you are declaring is actually reliably and verifiably true? And here's where we're crossing over from de declaring to defending, defending our declarations. And the answer, thank God, is yes. We're not like the Mormons who have faith because of some mystical experience. Uh, these are valid questions to ask because the, the Mormons, for example, they would declare, I have a testimony from the Holy Spirit that Mormonism is true. And I'd say, how do you know that? And they'd say, well, because I prayed about it. And I, I'd say, well, I prayed about it too, and God told me that it's false. So how do we, you know, so how do we know who's right? And they would say, well, the Bible's been changed. And I would say, how, do you have any evidence for that? And they don't, but we have evidence that the Bible has not been changed. Muslims as well, we were talking about them yesterday. They would assert right away, the Bible's been changed, it's corrupted, you cannot trust it, uh, therefore, the Quran is true. Well, how do you know that? We all have our scriptures that we're leaning upon for our authority. But the question is, who has the best evidence to show that our scriptures are, in fact, the word of God? And if it's objectively true, if it's absolutely true, then there should be other forms of evidence that support it. And I think there is. And I'll show you that there is. Um, and you could show unbelievers this by sending them YouTube videos on Facebook or in email. Here's one I would recommend called The Importance of the Dead Sea Scrolls by Randall Niles. I'll just read to you some of what he says. I mean, he basically just goes through the story in a Californian casual kind of way of uh, how the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. But he says, we live in an awesome time in history. In 1947, some Bedouin cousins, uh, some shepherd guys, were out by the Dead Sea in Israel, and they lost a goat, and they threw some rocks into a cave, and so they dropped in to the most incredible archaeological discoveries ever. This has become known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. That day, they dropped into a cave, to Cave One, and there they discovered the great Isaiah Scroll. We'll talk more about this and look at this uh, later in our presentation. And it contains all 66 chapters of Isaiah's prophecy. For example, the great uh, Isaiah scroll uh, that survived uh, 2,100 years. Um, well, I'll skip some of it. He says, so he goes to Isaiah 53, and what we read earlier. And he says, uh, no scholar has dated it uh, later than 100 B.C., so these, these are, have been proven to be ancient. Isaiah wrote in, in about 700 BC, and it was copied. Why is this phenomenal? phenomenal? The greatest messianic Bible prophecy, I would argue, is in Isaiah 53, the servant who would be beaten for our sins. Compare the Dead Sea Scrolls with the Masoretic text, uh, copies of the Bible from about a thousand years later, which before four, 1947, those were the oldest copies of the Old Testament we had, the Masoretic text. But they de date to a thousand years after Christ. So I don't know if you realize how significant this is, but uh, Google, I'll go to that one, uh, Google itself, if I can find it, okay, Let's use a Google search. If you do a Google search for the Dead Sea Scrolls, you'll come first to Wikipedia. And atheists love to cite Wikipedia for their evidence, for their arguments. Well, let's do the same for them. Let's say, okay, have you Googled the Dead Sea Scrolls? And there, since no scholar, even the atheist scholars, uh, would say that the Dead Sea Scrolls are written by the church to fabricate a religion, um, it's proof to them, uh, and, and it destroys a lot of their arguments. I mean, I can't tell you how many times on the streets I've talked to people, and they say, 
Everybody knows the Bible was written 300 years after Jesus. Well, that's just proven to be false. We have the Old Testament was obviously written before. And then New Testament, I'm not going to talk about New Testament today, but we talked about it yesterday already and the day before. Tom did a great job with the New Testament. But you can prove the gospel from the Old Testament. And so you go to Wikipedia and you see where, the, where they were discovered. There's a picture there they can look at in high definition of, this, of the cave where it was discovered. They could read the account of how it was discovered. They can find out all of the contents of what were in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And just to share with you, it's not just biblical scrolls there. There was a community that they think it was the Essenes, uh, which was a Jewish sect uh, that lived between 150 BC and 72 AD. And these Essenes were very meticulous about their library. They had uh, the whole Old Testament there. Every, all 39 books of the Old Testament except for the book of Esther, was found in these caves. And multiple copies of them were found. Um, there were total between 800 and 900 scrolls found in these caves. Google ha has uh, produced a video to introduce people to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now my computer's going on standby. Um, let me get my power cord, just one second. Um, let me get my laptop over here. The dating, the question was, for those listening on the internet, how did they date the, the scrolls that they were so old? Uh, several different ways. I'm proof that God chooses the fool, foolish of the world to confound the wise. All right. Well, the dating of the scrolls was confirmed through several different means. Uh, number one, well, I don't know what order, but for one, there, is a, uh, there were coins found in the caves as well, and none of the coins were minted after 9 BC. A lot of them were minted about 150 BC. They also did carbon dating on the manuscripts themselves. Um, which is not an exact science, as we all know, maybe. But the carbon dating dates them no earlier than 100 BC. Um, they did, they have, well, other technology, this doesn't help with, infer, with uh, the dating, but they, they used infrared technology. Uh, when they were discovered, they didn't have the infrared technology. They, they, just, they did find a bunch of manuscript fragments that were like black, just looked like burnt potato chips. But then you put this infrared light on it and a camera that can pick it up, and, and then there's letters. Um, so they use a lot of different technology. They examined the weaving of uh, some of these scroll, scrolls were wrapped in a linen material. So they examined the weaving against what they knew in archaeology uh, to be the weaving of that era. Um, so a lot of different scientific tests they've done, DNA evidence. Um, they've, not all of the scrolls were intact. Some of them were, uh, most of them were fragments. The best kept scroll was the Isaiah scroll. And so that's what I would go to first as the best evidence, which itself was dated uh, to about 150 BC. And so you have um, a lot of different science, uh, you know, there's different ways of reasoning, whether you want to reason philosophically about the prophecies, how can they be fulfilled, or scientifically, all of these proofs of the dating of it, or um, 
there's just a bunch of different ways to find out the dating. Very good question. But n no, one, no one doubts it. So we have evidence on our side to show the atheist, the skeptic, the Muslim, the Mormon, and just people that are ignorant about the Bible um, and its authority. Are you seeing a presentation now? Yes. Giving answer for our hope? Okay. Okay, we're not looking at... All righty. So the first half of my talk really is about the Dead Sea Scrolls. The rest of what I would like to talk about is what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because you can prove to someone how old they are, and they're going to be like, okay, so what? What does that prove? So there's some ancient manuscripts, and so what? Okay, so then the textual criticism comes out, and you begin to examine and compare the Dead Sea Scrolls with the Masoretic text. And you can find out how accurate is, how accurately did they preserve these Bibles be, between the 1,100 years uh, of these manuscripts. And uh, Norman Geisler has said, for example, in Isaiah 53, uh, that there's less than 17, there's no more than 17 uh, variant readings, and none of them change any significant meaning of the text. They're grammatical things, they're scribal errors as far as spelling mistakes or uh, not necessarily mistakes but just variants in spellings uh, and there are very, f there's just no significant change to the text over a thousand years. So it just proves what we knew to be true that the Jews very carefully, very meticulously guarded the scriptures and uh, they didn't want to change anything um, because they were keeping God's word. And so Peter, he would point us to this as well. In 2 Peter 1, verse 19 to 21, he says, So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So this is a declaration. This is a claim of inspiration in the Bible. But I like this word, sure. You see that in verse 19? The pro prophetic word made more Sure, to which you will do well to pay attention. So let's do that now. Let's pay attention to the prophetic evidence for the gospel. The more sure word. And this is not a new approach. God himself uses this approach with Israel, and Jesus uses this approach in his ministry. He, it says in Ezekiel 33, 33, so when it comes to pass, as surely it will, then they will know that a prophet has been in their midst. I love that. How will you know that these people are actually prophets of God? I mean, we can't read their minds to hear how God is speaking to them to write these things down. How do we know that they didn't just invent these things, as we would say Muhammad did, or, or as we would say Joseph Smith did with Islam and Mormonism? How do we know that these are, in fact, the words of God? Well, very easy. It came to pass. It came to pass. You would surely know that a prophet had been in their midst. Jesus, when he came, he said in John 13, 19, From now on I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. And... I don't know about you, but I'm sort of like the disciples. It took them a while to actually figure it out, for it to dawn on them. I mean, Jesus predicted, I'm going to die, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be handed over and crucified, and on the third day I will rise. And they're like, okay, what, what do you mean you're going away? And he's like, I was talking about that three minutes ago. I'm going to the cross. And Peter's like, no, 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 no. 
Far be it from you. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in your mind the thoughts of God, but the thoughts of man. And then it, after Jesus rose from the dead, he appears to them on the road to Emmaus. Some of the disciples are walking. And he says, uh, what are you so sad about? This is my paraphrase. What, what's, what's going on? And they said, haven't you heard the things that have happened? You know, this Jesus of Nazareth, they were veiled from seeing who it was that they were talking with. Uh, that he, we had hoped that he would be the Messiah and that he would reign and that he would, you know, deliver us. And, and yet he's been crucified. And he said, oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe all that was written in the prophets. Was it not written that the Christ should suffer and then enter into his glory? And he began to open the scriptures unto them. And this is in uh, Luke 24. And he says... Uh, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't give us that Bible study. I wish I had that Bible study. And every time I've heard that passage taught in church, I've heard the pastor say, if only we had the MP3 for that Bible study. Well, that planted a seed in my heart saying, well, why don't we, why don't we do a search through the Bible and see what Jesus would have said? Because it says, as they heard Jesus speaking, their hearts burned within them. And... Uh, you know, their faith just increased, and, and, the, and it also says in John's gospel that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So for me, this is key. And in my evangelism, in, in missions, in the church, this is the key. And in Bible college, this is the key for you. You're trying to make sense of all of these facts, all of this information. It all comes back to Jesus. It all comes back to the cross. Without Jesus, the scriptures are not going to make sense for you. John 5.39. I don't have this in front of you on the screen, but write it down. John 5.39. Memorize the scripture. Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me. But he said to the Jews, you refuse to come to me that you may have life. That's a rebuke. And so how much more should we be searching the scriptures for Jesus Christ, looking for Jesus in the Old Testament as well? Those were the scriptures that they had at the time when Jesus walked the earth, just the Old Testament. And so I want, I want to make the case uh, for the Jew and the Gentile that the gospel is in the Old Testament. And I loved how Tom went through like the whole Old Testament history in ju just from memory and just kind of rattling off all of the, the prophecies and stuff like that. And I kind of wanted to attempt to do that. But focusing just on this messianic prophecy. Okay? So if you need to close your eyes or, or you don't, you're not going to have time to write all of this down. But I'm going to go from Genesis to Malachi. Uh, just from what I can remember, Lord help me, of messianic prophecy. And so get this picture in your head. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was perfect. And he told Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit. And they ate of the fruit, and sure enough, they, they died spiritually. Then they were separated from God. So that's the problem. But immediately, the first gospel is proclaimed. To who? To Satan, the snake who deceived them, and the curse. I, uh, what does it say? Um, her seed will crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15. That's the, what's called the Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel. It was to the, to the, first, uh, the first generation of people living on the earth. Adam and Eve were there to hear it. And so God was from the very beginning giving this messianic expectation. There will come a savior, though this sin mars the world. Is the, is the root problem in the heart of man. I will send someone, and who will he be? The seed of the woman. So it's just a hint of the virgin birth of Jesus. So we're looking for a virgin-born man who would be a descendant of who? Eve. Okay, we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. But God would be even more specific. If you read Genesis and Exodus and, and the books of Moses, you, you begin seeing that God is choosing a genealogy through Eve, through Seth, through Enoch, through, of course, Noah and his sons were the only ones to survive the flood. So 
uh, through uh, Noah, all the way down to uh, David. God was reiterating this promise. I'm going to send a seed. So the key verse for Gen- the, the key theme for Genesis, looking for Jesus in Genesis, is look for the seed. And so God spoke to Abraham the gospel. It says in Galatians, God preached the gospel to Abraham, saying, In you, in your seed, shall all the nations be blessed. That's the gospel to Abraham. He didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but he had the promise of God. He looked forward to the Savior. We look back to the Savior. You know, we look back 2,000 years and believe that Jesus died for our sins. Abraham heard that promise from God, and in Genesis 15, 6, it says, he believed in the Lord, and the Lord accounted it to him for righteousness. This verse is quoted several times in the New Testament as the basis for justification by faith. So let me ask you, people who believed in the Old Testament, are they saved? Did Abraham, after he died, perish? Or did he go to a place of comfort? He went to a place of comfort. Jesus said, you know, it talked about Abraham's bosom being a place of comfort and, and the other place of torment in Luke 16. So you start with Abraham. And then 400 years later, you have Moses going up the mountain and getting the Ten Commandments. Well, what was the purpose of the Ten Commandments? Was it to uh, make us good people? No, it was to show us how sinful we truly are, how much we need the gospel, that how much we need a Savior. And so uh, all of Israel's history is given, I think, to prove to us that no matter how hard you try, you cannot be good enough by your works, that you can only be justified as Abraham was justified, by faith. And so they go through the cycle of apostasy and judges, and they have... Uh, you know, deliverers that come, these deliverers can be a foreshadow of Christ who would uh, bring us back to God. You have other types and shadows of Jesus in the Old Testament. I mean, going, even starting with Adam. Paul says that Adam was a type of he who is to come. Jesus is called the second Adam. And so I would just challenge you. This is like, you're not going to be able to write it all down now. And it's going to take a lifetime to really to get all of the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. Uh, I would challenge you to read your Bible with those lenses on. Where is Jesus? Again, Jesus said, search the scriptures, uh, for in them you think you have eternal life, but these testify of me. So find Jesus and then come to Jesus. And so all of Israel's history shows you cannot be righteous by your own works. And then you have the, the Psalms. The Psalms are full of messianic prophecy. Peter quotes from the Psalms when he's uh, giving the gospel in Acts, and he says that David was a prophet. He was not only a king, but he was a prophet. And he prophesied about the resurrection. Psalm 22 is one of the best-known uh, prophecies about the crucifixion. He is predicting the pierced hands and feet. This was long before the uh, Roman crucifixion was even invented. And so we have this more sure word of prophecy. Um, Jesus himself, when he entered the temple, he quoted from Isaiah, uh, saying, I, I can't read that, that's too small. But, uh, okay, that's a different prophecy. But you know the, the story where Jesus went into the Nazareth synagogue and read, op- opened the scroll of Isaiah, and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, uh, to proclaim liberty to the captives. He was reading a messianic prophecy, and he rolled up the scroll after reading it and said, this has been fulfilled in your presence. So this Isaiah scroll, scroll is great. and You can point people to it. And uh, it's now online. Uh, Google has put it online using their technology. Let me see if I can find it for you. Okay. Here's a website I would highly recommend you, you find online. Can you read the URL there? DSS something, is it too small? Well, you can find it um, through searching uh, in quotes, Dead Sea Scrolls. End quote, and then 
write a Bible verse like, he was bruised for our iniquities. And then it will lead you to this site where not only is this a high definition scan of the actual Dead Sea Scroll that they discovered, the great Isaiah Scroll, but you can zoom in and then you can click on the Hebrew text and get the Masoretic translation from the Masoretic text that, that is virtually the same as the Dead Sea Scrolls. So they've translated this. Jews would accept this as authoritative and we would accept it. Although our translations may be slightly different from the Masoretic translation that the Jews use. You can still use it for a Jew or anybody um, to look at the actual text. Um, have a disadvantage. I cannot look at the screen and my thing here, but if I was with an unbeliever, here's what I would do. I would take them to Google's video on the Dead Sea Scrolls and how, it, I mean, it's, it's a lovely thing just that it, it shows you, maybe I can find it here. Did your presentation go away? No? Okay. Okay, let's see if we can do this. I'm going to drag this over for you. Do you see a video there? Okay. <laughs> Sorry for people that are watching online, but you can see this video yourself later. I'm going to have to come around here. Do you hear that? The greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century. This is not Christians that are saying this. This is Google. This is uh, the authorities on the Dead Sea Scrolls. The greatest archaeological discoveries. So when an atheist or a skeptic asks you for evidence, say, well, we know that these scrolls predate the time of Christ. Now let's get into some of the scriptures. And you'll just use your Bible for this. Um, so I'm actually going to, I'll just leave what's on the screen up there. Is that okay? Pay no attention to the screen. <laughs> I can't control this thing anymore. 
All right, so let's look at our Bibles. I think Satan's constant desire is to keep us out of our Bibles. Amen? Someone said to me, All right, this book will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from this book. Satan wants to do all he can to get people out of it. So now that we prove the antiquity of it, let's actually get into the text. Um, use the Isaiah scroll. Let's look in our Bibles at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Now as you're turning there, I'll remind you of something said in the New Testament that Isaiah said the, it says, I don't remember where, you can search your Bible, but in the New Testament it says, Isaiah said these things because he saw the Lord's glory. Jesus was, appeared to Isaiah. In chapter 6, Jesus, Jesus appeared, I believe, uh, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. He said, I saw the Lord. I think he saw the Lord Jesus. Okay, so in chapter 7, though, verse 14, we read a messianic prophecy. It says, Behold, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, textual critics would look very closely at these words in the Hebrew of the Masoretic text and the Hebrew of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they would point out there's a couple of differences, but it doesn't change the meaning whatsoever. The only difference is like one word is divided into two words. There's a space between them. Or the, vowel, uh, the vowels are different. Or the grammar is different. Instead of saying, um, like to him, it says them. Uh, it, that, those are just minor examples from other, other verses. But this one, no one would argue that it says the Lord, Yahweh, or Hashem, as the Jews would say. Hashem meaning the name because they didn't pronounce the name of Yahweh or Jehovah. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Okay, so God, this is an apologetic. How are we going to believe? Well, God will give you a signpost. He'll give you uh, evidence for the Messiah. And here's the evidence. The virgin shall conceive. Now, that would be a miracle. Some people say, well, that can't be since uh, I don't believe in miracles. You say, well, just not believing in some, something, does that make it not true? Um, logically, things can be real that you don't believe. Your believing doesn't make reality. But the virgin shall conceive. Can, speaking to an, a skeptic, can you grant that if a virgin did conceive and bear a child, that that would be a miracle? And they say, yeah, that it would have to be a miracle because it can't happen naturally. Okay, follow that logic. If it would have to be a miracle and it did happen, would that be sufficient proof as evidence, uh, proof of a supernatural God? Because what you need to understand is most people in the world we're living in are naturalists. They believe in naturalistic explanations for everything. There is no God, and therefore, everything has to be explained with science, something physical. And so if there's supernatural things, they would automatically rule it out as impossible. But we have here God saying, I'm going to give you a supernatural sign, evidence, that Jesus is the Messiah. And so the Messiah would have to be born of a virgin. Now, in identifying the Messiah, how many people in that pool of options do you have? You can't say, well, lots of people are born of virgins. No, there's really only one in human history. I mean, something could happen um, technically with, that a virgin could conceive, uh, but there would still be a sperm involved. There would still be that natural explanation. But the angel appeared to Mary and said, you shall conceive. And she said, how shall this be since I have not known a man? And he said, the power of the Most High will come upon you. And the angel also revealed this to Joseph. He was about to divorce her because he knew that's naturally impossible. Um, but the Lord is giving this sign. 
Now, people in Nazareth probably teased Mary because they didn't believe that this was possible because they're viewing the world naturalistically. Uh, but when Jesus did other miracles, um, you can say that Mary was vindicated. In fact, some people say in John chapter 2 when she says, they ran out of wine, she was hoping to vindicate herself because if he did a miracle, then it would be proof that Jesus really is supernatural and he could have been virgin born. But this is just one prophecy. The beginning of Jesus' life, his on earth, his conception. Looking through the rest of the Bible, you can look at um, Malachi 5.2 that says where he would be born. In the little town of Bethlehem. Now there's prob probably only between 700 and 1,000 people living in Bethlehem at that time when Jesus was born. And one of them had to be virgin born. So you take all of these prophecies together. These are just two. And you say, you can say the likelihood that it was anyone other than Jesus Christ is, you know, virtually impossible. The reason why we need to show specific prophecies is because people will say, oh, well, the Bible is just so vague. It's like Nostradamus saying, you know, many, many years later, there's going to come someone who will change the world. Well, that's so vague. How will they change the world? And who is this someone? But if I said to you, there's going to come someone into the Budapest airport at 5 o'clock on such and such a plane from such a country. He's going to be wearing one red shoe, one green shoe. be wearing a very tall hat. He walks with a limp. He has a cane and an umbrella. And he has a name tag, and his name is Bob. And I send you to the airport to go pick him up. And you see all the people, well, the more you see how the more specific uh, predictions I give you, the more accurately you can identify who it is, and you can rule out everyone else. So he had to be virgin born. He had to be born in Bethlehem. He had to then uh, flee to Egypt. You go through the Gospels of Matthew, and, and just maybe you're not looking for these things, but start looking for these things where it says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which said, and you have a fulfilled messianic prophecy. So the way I view the, vi the Bible now Instead of Old Testament, you know, God was mean, New Testament, God is nice, which is a misnomer. The Old Testament, God predicting the Messiah coming. In the New Testament, the fulfillment of God's promises. So promise, fulfillment. And then you look at the rest of Jesus' life. Well, he had to be called a Nazarene, so he had to live in Nazareth. He had to have a ministry in Galilee because in Isaiah 9, he says that he's a light to the Gentiles. In Isaiah, is it 14? No. Isaiah 9 actually says another prophecy. So let's go ahead and look. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it. And so a child, God himself, the mighty God, would come down in the form of a child. And so we read about the childhood of Jesus in the New Testament. And there's some prophecies in here about the government resting on his shoulders and his, uh, of his, the increase of his government and peace. There will be no end. Obviously, this is speaking of still future prophecies because Jesus didn't come to set up a, a human government on earth. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. And so we're looking at the prophecies from his first coming and his second coming in Isaiah. Now, that prophecy where Jesus unrolled it in Nazareth and said, this has been fulfilled in your presence. Jesus himself didn't read the complete chapter. He just read the part that had been fulfilled in his first coming. Let me see if I can find that reference for you. I'm using eSword. How many of you use eSword as a Bible program? None of you. I would highly recommend it. It's free and it is, it, it's 
there's a place for you to write your notes. There's dictionaries, lots of free commentaries, and, and all kinds of things. So I'm going to use it to find this verse. Fulfilled in your presence. Anyway, the, I'm not finding it. The point I wanted to make from that is Jesus stopped. Did, did you find it? Oh, thank you very much. Okay, let's turn to Isaiah 61. Thank you very much. And I'm almost done here. Okay, so turn to Isaiah 61. And Jesus read verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the, and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And it goes on, but G where did Jesus stop? He read all of verse 1, and he read the beginning of verse 2 to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he closed the scroll. So what, where did he stop? Why didn't he read the rest of it? It says, and the day of the vengeance of our God. So Jesus' first coming wasn't the day of the vengeance of our God. That would be his second coming, wouldn't it? Where he pours out his wrath on the unbelieving world uh, after rapturing the church. You read in Revelation 6 through 19, of the wrath and the vengeance of God in that day of the tribulation period. And so Jesus is saying, I'm fulfilling the, the prophecies of my first coming. Today, this is fulfilled in your presence. There will come a day when he fulfills the rest of the prophecies. But you can, you can say with 100% certainty that he fulfilled all of the prophecies regarding his first coming. So we can trust that he will fulfill 100% of the prophecies concerning his second coming. You know, that's, and that's basically how trust works in any relationship. You have people that you trust, and why do you trust them? Well, because they've been generally faithful before. They promise that they'll be at a certain place at 3 o'clock, and they're there usually 3 o'clock, maybe a few minutes late. If they're constantly late by a half an hour or an hour, you begin to lose trust. But if, God, if someone is always, 100% of the time, faithful in what they promise, then there's no reason to doubt it. There's no logical reason to doubt it. Then there's only emotional reasons to doubt it because of ulterior motives. And so we can do our best to give people the reason for the hope that we have. Going through all of the scrolls of Isaiah, uh, I mean, through all of the prophecies in Isaiah is one method. Um, I'm actually working on a gospel tract going through that, giving people a copy of the text um, with the Messianic prophecies. Um, I have a lot of work to do, as you could tell, on that tract, but I think it's going to be very powerful. We also spent a year as a church in Riga going through the Old Testament, an overview in one year, looking at Jesus in every book of the Bible. And we found him in practically every chapter of the Bible. There's something said about Jesus. So I'd encourage you, read your Bible looking for Jesus um, and share the gospel using the apologetic that God himself uses. Fulfilled prophecy. So I want to leave uh, a few minutes for questions. I have eight more minutes. Do you have any questions about what I've shared about the Dead Sea Scrolls? or about Isaiah, or using these things in evangelism? Yes? What's the other thing called, how the Dead Sea Scroll the end? Masoretic, the Masoretic text. Now, of course, people are not going to always agree on the interpretation of these Messianic prophecies. But we would lean upon uh, the New Testament as being the best commentary and the best interpretation of the Old Testament. The Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. 
the, the New Testament is in the Old concealed, while the Old Testament is in the New revealed. Let me give you some, um, another quote. Do you have the Rabbi Zacharias quote on the screen? No. Sorry. I'm going to close this. Okay, do you see the Rabbi Zacharias quote? How about now? Okay. Rabbi Zacharias says, you will find in that answers, in answers to questions, that is apologetics, it went away? That one? You see it now? Okay. You will find that in answers to questions, the biggest danger is to get so cerebral, that is mental or intellectual, that you forget the source of the answers. Sometimes a relationship with Christ is far greater than any cerebral answer you can give to a question. Apologetics is the seasoning. The gospel is the main course. You do not want too much seasoning or you will make the main course insipid or impalatable. Does that make sense? So that's how I use apologetics. Uh, since this is an apologetics class, I didn't really get into the gospel so much, unfortunately. Are there any other questions? If not, I'll share more of the gospel. And this is a, something, for, if you're going to be a missionary, actually we're all called to be missionaries, no matter where we are in the world or what we're doing. Um, we're all called to share the gospel. And so part of my journey, part of my passion is for the gospel message. This is the main course. Um, get to know the gospel, what it really is. Not like I had in my childhood. Oh, I know John 3.16. It's far deeper than that. We'll spend our lives trying to understand and express and communicate the gospel in more accurate, more detailed, more powerful ways. I'm still growing in this, but uh, through my experience, I've definitely purified in my motives in coming to the gospel. We don't want to present the gospel with a motive of just having them raise a hand or say a prayer. We want them to know Jesus. And so, Share the gospel, focus on Jesus, and search the gospel, search for the gospel in the Old Testament. Um, so the good news is this, and, and, and this is what I share with people, that God loves you, uh, but we've sinned against him, we've rebelled against him. Yet God in his love and in his patience has promised to send a Messiah, and he did send that Messiah. And he lived the perfect life that we should have lived, and he died the death that we should have died. And he rose again, proving that he is the Messiah, that, he, that the payment for our sins was accepted. And he appeared to more than 500 people at one time. This also is a good apologetic. I think tomorrow you'll get uh, into the, the, the resurrection. So I won't go into that too much. But in the gospel, we want to talk about the, the cross, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I came and I declared the gospel to you according to the scripture, that Christ was buried, according to the scripture, that, sorry, I'm quoting it wrong, that Christ was crucified for our sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he rose again according to the scripture, and that he appeared to many. And he goes through the appearances. But notice that phrase, according to the scripture. So here's the challenge. Are you preaching the gospel according to the scripture on your outreaches? Or are you preaching a cultural gospel? You know, how, do you, how will you know? Well, search the scriptures to see if it's so. I'm telling you that Jesus is all over in the Old Testament. Don't just believe me. Search the scriptures to see that it's so. Be a Berean, Acts 17.11. So... Get the gospel out, and apologetics is a useful tool. I hope I've given you some useful uh, pointers where you can point people to on the Internet. Wikipedia talks about the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Great Isaiah Scroll, and then go to the Google Video, go to these other resources where you can look closely at the Dead Sea Scrolls, and make sure to tell people how to find Jesus in there. You have a question in the back.
is the question is is Jesus in a human body in heaven right now? It's a good question. Um, when he appeared after the resurrection, he said, "You know, touch my hands and and see the nail where the nails were, and reach in and touch where where the spear was in my side." He said, "I'm not I'm not a ghost. I'm flesh and bone." So Jesus was risen in a physical body, but it's not the same kind of body as we have in this before we die. We're, Paul says we are raised, we're, we die. No. You'll learn about it on the resurrection uh, talk tomorrow. But yeah, the basic answer is yes. Jesus is still in a human body, physical body, but it's a resurrected, glorified body that's fit for the heavens. Same kind of body that we'll receive in the resurrection. Does that answer your question briefly? That's not what you meant? Yeah, a glorified, resurrected body. Okay, my time is up in one minute, so I thank you for your attention. I hope you got a lot out of it, and let's pray. Jesus, thank you for saving a wretch like me for strengthening my faith over the years. The more I look into the Bible, the more I see you, and the more I see my need for you to come to you daily and deny myself and take up my cross and follow you. I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to uh, be the kind of disciples that follow you closely and follow the example that you gave in the scripture of pointing people to the Old Testament to strengthen their faith in you. And so, Lord, I pray for these students that you would equip them through the rest of the week and, and that as they hear all of these things, that they would be coming to you in their hearts. Draw them, Lord, and draw other people through them. I pray that the fragrance of Christ would just be so evident in their lives that they would draw people just by their own love for you, but also with the answers that they can give. Thank you for just the great privilege of being able to serve you and be used by you and for choosing the, uh, the foolish of the world to confound the wise. Lord, be glorified in our lives, we pray. And uh, thank you for this opportunity, God. Just pray for your um, blessing on the rest of this week. In Jesus' name.